everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be population distribution and demographics. So let's get your objectives and then we'll get going for the day. By the end of this video, three things that, that I need you to know or be able to do. First one, describe methods used to calculate population density. Second, describe patterns of population distribution. And third, explain qualities of a population tracked by demographers. So that's what we're after. Let's go ahead and get there. Um, as we're talking about ecology, the first thing that we need to talk about is what exactly is a population? For the purpose of our discussions throughout this ecology section, population is simply defined as individuals of the same species in the same place at the same time. Now, it doesn't matter what sort of organism you're talking about. If it's a living organism and you're talking about its population, then you're going to talk about all of the organisms that are of its same species that are in the same place at the same time. So when I am teaching a class, the population would be my classroom because we're all humans within the same room, but students outside of the classroom, they don't count as part of the population because they're not in the same place at the same time. Now, as we're talking about population, there are several qualities of a population that we're going to talk about. And the first one of those is density. And this is just how many individuals live in a defined area. Now, some places have got very high population density. Some areas have got very low population density. Um, speaking about the human population, if you think of places that got really high population density, you got like Tokyo and Hong Kong and Calcutta and New York City, places like that where a lot of people are living together very closely. That's high population density. And then if you think out towards the rural areas of Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, where you know people have got farms, they're all spread out from each other, that would be low population density. Now, calculating population density and population in general can be a difficult thing to do. So there's three methods that scientists use to calculate population density and also um, to estimate the size of a population. I'm just going to talk through each one. We're not going to go through them all in depth, but you need to be aware of them. First one is a simple count. So if you're dealing with big mammals or big organisms, so let's say whales, uh, elephants, buffalo, things like that, scientists can fairly easily fly over a population in an airplane or a helicopter, count it, and then use that to extrapolate an estimate of population size. So that's easy. Random sampling would be if a scientist were to say, let's say our scientist was looking at oak trees and he wanted to know how many oak trees were living in an area of a forest. What he would do is take several hundred meter by hundred meter square samples, so a thousand square meter samples, and in each of these random samples, he would count how many oak trees there are. So let's say each sample has three oak trees in it. He would then use that average for 1,000 square meters to extrapolate how many oak trees there should be in the forest as a whole. Um, one of the last methods that they can use is called the mark recapture method. And basically what scientists do is they go out, they capture a bunch of organisms, they mark them in some way. If we got our shells there, they paint them, they tag them, put radio tags on them. Um, some animals have got distinctive markings, so they can just take a picture of them. Either way, they capture and mark a large sample of organisms, let them go, give them a few days or weeks to recirculate back into the population, then capture a new set of organisms of the same size, see how many of their original marked organisms they've got, and then use that proportion to kind of make an estimate about how many organisms are in the population as a whole. So that is the mark recapture method. Now, the density of a population does change over time. There's some major factors that can cause changes in the density. Um, first two easy ones are births and deaths. If you've got a population that has a lot of babies or organisms being born and not so many dying, that's going to cause your density to go up. If you've got the opposite situation where you have several dying and not many being born, population density is going to go down. Immigration is going to be individuals moving into the area, which is going to cause density to go up. And immigration with an E is people moving out of an area or organisms moving out of an area, and that's going to cause your population density to go down. The other thing that we talk about with regard to populations is dispersion. So in the area, how are they spaced out and spread out from one another? And there's basically three types, clumped, uniform, and random. Organisms that show a clumped distribution pattern are 
exactly what it sounds like, clumped. If you look at that map there, or the globe on the right, that shows the world at night, and you can see that humans in general display a clumped uh, dispersion pattern. We are clumped in areas where there are resources. So you can see like India, boom, lots of lights. Uh, middle of Africa, not so much. So humans clump distribution pattern, we clump around resources. The next type of distribution pattern is a uniform pattern. And this is seen a lot of times in organisms that have territories that they defend. So some birds, what they will do is they will build nests on the ground. And let's say here's our nest for the bird. The bird will basically sit in its nest and peck anything that comes within the reach of its beak. So that means that its neighbor is going to be over here. It needs to be just out of the reach of this one and out of the reach of its neighbor over here. So as all of these birds sit in their nests and defend their territory, each one is going to be placed just outside of the reach of all of the others, giving you a uniform distribution pattern. And the last one is a random distribution pattern. And this is just where individuals are spread out all over the place. And a good example of this is um, plants that have got seeds that are spread by the wind, like the dandelion. You can look there on our field and you can see in the front, you've got a bunch of dandelions. Then there's kind of a gap. Then in the back, you can see some more. So that would be a random dispersion pattern. Now let's talk a little bit about demographics. And basically what a demographer does is they study how the vital statistics of a population change over time. So if you take that population, watch it over 50 years, is the average age getting higher? Is it getting lower? Life expectancy going up, life expectancy going down, is the population growing, shrinking, becoming more dense, less dense? Basically looking at all that stuff is the job of a demographer. And the rest of the video is going to be specific qualities of a population that they look at as they're doing their thing. So the first one is a life table. On the right, you got a really super blurry table, but basically what happens is life insurance companies back in the early part of the 1900s started putting together these tables that essentially estimated what part of a population is going to be alive at a certain age. And what you do to construct a life table is you take a cohort, which is basically a group of organisms born about the same time, and you follow them throughout their lives. And you basically break their lifespan into categories. So like zero to five years of age, six to 10, 11 to 15, things like that. And you note how many males and females are alive at each of those life stages and figure out proportionally when the greatest number of individuals are expected to be alive and then how the rate of decline goes over time. So do a lot of the organisms die off like in their early years and then the rest live out a pretty full life or do most of them survive the early years and then there's a constant rate of decline as they get older. Basically it's looking at how does this population um, age and pass away over time. Scientists use life tables to construct survivorship curves, which basically is a graphical representation of how many organisms are going to be alive at any given time in their lifespan or expected life expectancy. And there's three types of curves. In a type one curve right here, you got percent of lifespan. So basically how much of the maximum lifespan is that organism going to live? You start out with a population size of 1,000. Um, so type one survivorship curve is right here. This is what humans generally have, where for the most part, the organisms survive their early years, and then there's a sharp decline in the later years of life. This is generally seen in larger animals that have very few offspring and take pretty good care of their young. You've got a type three survivorship curve where a bunch of the young die off of in, like immediately, and then those that survive show a pretty constant rate of decline after that. You see this in organisms that have a ton of young and don't really take care of them very much. And then you've got organisms in a type two survivorship curve that show a pretty constant rate of decline over time. So they're not more or less likely to die young or early or anything like that. Final thing that we wanna talk about today is reproductive rates. And basically this is tracking how many female children a female will have. Now, the reason we watch females is because females are the ones that are able to have the children, obviously. So by tracking how many female children a lady is having, um, 
demographers can kind of make predictions about what's going to happen to the population size of a country over time. If a woman is, say, having one female child in her lifetime, then your population is going to be pretty much the same because you're at replacement level where when she dies, there will be a daughter to uh, kind of take her place. Now, if you've got a place where uh, women are having, you know, five, six, seven kids, you can kind of infer that that population is going to be growing very rapidly because you've got five female children replacing one female mother, and each of those five children might have five children of their own. So you can expect that that population is going to grow rapidly, where conversely, if you've got a lady and she doesn't have any female children, then you can guess that that population is probably going to start shrinking over time. So that would be looking at reproductive rates. And all of that together is a brief introduction to populations and demography. Hope it was helpful for you. My name is Mr. Kite. This has been the Lab 207 webcast, and we'll see you again.